The series is called Certainty, meaning that we're trying to take the un out of uncertainty for a moment. We've all said uncertainty so many times in the last few months that it's time to stop thinking about the things that we're not sure of and to think about the things that we're confident in. And we've talked about a few of those already. We're confident in the fact that God sees us. We talked last week about how we're confident in the fact that God is able. And today I want to talk about something else we can be certain of, and that is this, that God has a plan. God has a plan. You can be sure of it. Right now, today, God has a plan. And not only does he have a plan, he has a plan for your life. I remember when I was coming up through high school and college, there was a little booklet that helped you share your faith with a, a random stranger if you needed a little help. It was called The Four Spiritual Laws. Does anybody remember this? And it just came to my mind this week while I was thinking about this idea that God has a plan uh, because this little booklet, it was written by Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade, which is now called Crew. And the first of the four spiritual laws, does anybody remember it? If you had that little booklet, I saw some hands come up. If you had that little booklet, you, you know the first spiritual law. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's the first thing you wanted to say to somebody starting a conversation around faith. And it's a good thing for us to say today. God has a plan, A, and God has a plan for your life. You can count on it. The prophet Jeremiah said it this way, a verse that many of us have memorized over the course of our life. In, in 29, 11, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So no matter what the circumstance is telling you today, I'm telling you this, God has a plan. No matter what's happening in the global climate right now, God has a plan. And whatever's going on in your life personally today, God has a plan. A few big ideas. Number one, God always has a plan, period. Genesis 1, 26, we're going to look at a few of his early plans. He says, let us make man in our image. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are talking together, and they have a plan. What is their plan? They're going to make mankind in their image, in our likeness. So in verse 27, if God has a plan, God fulfills his plan. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. God had a plan. In Genesis 12, verse 2, God has a plan. He says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed by you. I have a plan. Then if you'll fast forward to Genesis 50, verse 19. Joseph, as we know, has been through the ringer. He's put in a pit and abandoned by his brothers. He's found a home in a palace where he's serving a powerful leader. He's falsely accused, imprisoned again. He's forgotten in the prison the last time, but then raised up into the palace finally at the right time. And now he stands before his same brothers who put him in the pit to start with. And he says, Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. In other words, God had a plan in accomplishing what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Exodus 3, 7, the burning bush, God has a plan. And the Lord said, he's speaking to Moses, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God had a plan. 400 years, his people had been in bondage, but God had a plan. Galatians 4, 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. When there were no people, God had a plan. I'm going to make some people. Uh, When those people rebelled, and now there's a chasm between God and those he had created, he said, I'm going to need a a family, and Abraham, you're going to start it. You're going to be the father of a mighty nation. I have a plan. Uh, that, That plan needed a savior, And the Savior needed to come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so there were going to be many, many lives lost and a massive famine in the land. So God needed someone on the other side of the famine to be a blessing to the line that was going to produce the Savior that was promised through Abraham that was going to solve the problem that the people God created in the first place had made. And so Joseph needed to go through a very difficult series of events to be in the right place at the right time to know in wisdom because of his dream, we've got to store up during the years of plenty so that we'll have provision during the years of famine. That will draw my family into Egypt and then I'll be able to be a blessing to my family and to multitudes and God will bring about his plan and he'll bring about salvation. Now the people are in bondage for centuries, but God wants to deliver them and lead them into the promised land, and he needs somebody. So a bush is burning but not consumed, and Moses is brought in to the purposes and the plans of God, which will not fail. And then ultimately, at the end of the full time, Jesus arrives, and when the fullness of time has come, God sends forth his son, born of a woman and under law, to redeem those who were under the law that they might become sons. God always has a plan. And he's got a plan today. The second big idea is that God has a plan for your life. Now, this is where we all want to get. That first part, great. Thank you for that. You could have just skipped over that and said God has a plan. What I came to hear today is what is God's plan for my life? And this is where it's going to be very interesting today because there's going to be a little tension here. We want to know like, okay, God, I'm sure you're doing big things on earth, but, and that's all great, but what, do you, what is your plan for me is what I need to know. And what God is wanting to say today is, no, the big plan that I'm doing on earth, that is the plan. Now, the question for me to ask today is, how do I fit into your plan? So let's make man in our image. Therefore, Adam and Eve just got their plan. What was their plan? They got made in the image of God, in the likeness of God, to be in a relationship with God, to manage and steward the creation of God. They got their plan in God's plan. Abraham, though he was old and Sarah was old, though they were beyond childbearing years, Now they have a plan. What are we going to do? We're going to leave the land that that we know and go to a land that we don't know. That was the plan. And if someone heard that today, hey, I've got God's plan for your life. Leave where you are and follow God to somewhere you don't know where you're going. All right. And you'd be like, no, 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 that's not a good enough plan. I need a better plan than that. But God had a plan to build a mighty nation and to raise up a people. And therefore, Abraham now had a plan. I'm going to be used by God to be a part of a mighty nation. And the exact plan is leave everything behind and go somewhere where I don't know where I'm going. Just trust God. He's going to lead me. There was a plan for the provision, but for Joseph, that plan meant getting thrown in a pit. It meant getting sold into Potiphar's house, being falsely accused by his wife, barely escaping death in that moment and getting put back into a prison having a dream there and being 
obviously favored and anointed there, but being forgotten by this fellow prisoner who is going back up to be the cupbearer to the most powerful man on planet Earth until eventually they realize now he has a dream and, oh, there was a guy in the prison who was good with dreams. I forgot about him. I was supposed to remember him when I got out, but I forgot him, so he's been in there for a little bit longer, but let's get him back out now. All of a sudden, he becomes the second most powerful person on planet Earth, and he is in a position to save his entire our family. The dream and the plan of God gave Joseph his plan. And Moses got his plan and purpose in God's purpose. And Jesus got his purpose in God's purpose. I am now born in a manger, going to live 33 years on planet earth, got my eyes set on Calvary because there's a plan. I have a plan inside God's plan. I found my plan. So here's the key today. Knowing that God's plan includes you is different than you having a plan that hopefully includes God. This is a revelation. This is a game-changing revelation. To know that God has a plan and that plan is gonna inform my plan and my purpose is very different than me having a plan that hopefully in some way can include God into my plan. The third big idea today is this, that God rarely tells us the whole plan. <laughs> You're like, man, if you did just put some of these notes in your Instagram post, we could have slept in, gone to brunch, and <laughs> had a phenomenal morning. <laughs> he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Don't you wish Jeremiah had writ written you know the plans I have for you, <laughs> declares the Lord. No, God knows the plan. So there is a plan for your life, and there is a plan in general, but it's not likely God's going to tell you the whole plan. And you're like, well, I don't understand. He's a loving father, right? Well, why wouldn't he tell me the whole plan? In the same way that the loving fathers in this room do not tell their kids the whole plan. I was talking to a guy in the airport this week, didn't know him. He was explaining to me about their family vacation in great detail and how their family that lives somewhere up Minnesota or Michigan or Wisconsin or somewhere far away from uh, Disney World, that he and his wife had decided to take their kids to Disney World. And they had told their kids they were taking them to Disney World, um, but they had not told them they were flying to Disney World. And I, I forget the reason, and one of the kids would have freaked out, or some, there was some reason why they weren't telling them that. They, maybe they were holding that over their heads, or maybe that was going to be a payoff to something else they needed them to do later. But they, they, the kids were fired up that they were going to Disney World, but they hadn't told them they were flying yet. They were going to save that to the night before. And, and I was, uh, we were in a hurry. We were eating in a restaurant, sitting next to each other, and I was trying to pay my bill and leave and yes and all that. So I missed all the intricate details. But when I, when I walked away, I didn't think, what a terrible dad. What do you mean he's not going to tell his kids all the information? No one thinks that because you do not tell your kids all the information. They can't handle it. They don't know how to process it. They ask too many questions. They, they, once you tell them the information, they want to redo all the information. And so as a parent, you're just like, I know the plans, but I'm not telling you. So basically every parent says this almost every day. I know the plans I have for your life. They are good. They're not to harm you. They're to bless you and to prosper you. But I'm not telling you the plans. I know the plans I have for you. So if you're... If you're thinking today, if I can just do A, B, or C, I can get God to tell me all the plans, not likely. Because as soon as he did, we would start trying to alter them or avoid them or argue with him about them 
or miss what we're doing right now because we're concerned about something he said about six months from now. And so he says, say, just trust me and stay with me today because I'm not going to tell you the whole plan. I'm going to give give you what you need to know. You're like, no, I don't like where this is going. The fourth big idea is that God's plans will not fail. And you have to remember that he has a plan and he has plans now. You're like, well, he's not doing a very good job with his plans right now. Don't count God out. Hey, like, have you, have you been reading the news, Louie? We've got a global crisis going on on a hundred levels. Don't, don't count God out. God has a plan right now. This plan that he had for us in salvation shows us how great his plans are in general. I'm in Ephesians 1, and I just want to read a couple of verses. It says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So that's how you got saved. You're, you know, I was at a youth camp and there was a guy speaking and it was an amazing night and I felt something and I gave my life to Jesus. Yes, and, and all of that was the unfailing plan of God to save you. It says that he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And so all of history is bending into the plans of God and the purpose of God. And then the last big idea is this, that God's plans, and we say this around passion all the time, are for his glory and for our good. And we even see this in this particular text, verse 12. In order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So that's why we got saved. And you also, speaking to this church of new believers in Ephesus, were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, long dash in my Bible, to the praise of his glory. So even in salvation, you get all this benefit, he gets all the glory. Salvation is for my good, but it's in the same way for his glory. You don't just get saved so you can go to heaven. You get saved so that God can get praise. You don't get saved so that you can be a child of God. You get saved so that God can get praise from the the work that he does in and through your life. So the big idea is God has a plan. His plan includes you, but The plan that he has for you is a part of his plan. He's not going to tell you the whole plan, but you can trust that his purposes and plans are never going to fail. They're for your good and his glory. So those are the big ideas. So let's get a little more practical because somebody's saying, okay, that's all great. I agree with everything you've said so far, but what do I do now today? A few things. Number one, if you believe this, idea and that it's certain and true, then you start your day with a brand new grid and you start your day like this. God has a plan today. And that's a new grid. 
You don't start with the news, everything's gone crazy. You don't start with your own thoughts. I don't know how I feel about life. You start with a new grid and you go, you know what? It's Monday and you know what? On Monday, God has a plan. I don't have a job, but God has a plan. We did not get the news from the doctor that we were praying for, but God has a plan. We don't have the finances, present tense, to do the thing that has to be done, but God has a plan. I don't feel good, but God has a plan. That's the new grid for me. And so I'm not starting with the, we don't have the finances. I'm not starting with, we didn't get the news. I'm not starting with, I don't have a job. I'm not starting with how I feel. I'm starting with a brand new grid today. God has a plan. And and then I'm going to ask this question about Monday. God, what is your plan for me in your plan today? Because that's what I want to do on Monday. I want to be in your plan today. So... I am in this situation, but in this situation, maybe I do have a job. Maybe we did get the news we wanted. Maybe we did just get the bonus we weren't expecting. Maybe I feel great. I want to know how can I fit in what you're doing today? Because I I think you have a plan for my place of work today. I think you have a plan for this meeting I'm going to in in Boise. I think you have a plan for this conversation I'm having with my friend over coffee. I think you have a plan for this meeting we have with the doctor. I think you have plans. So what is your plan for me and your plan today? That's what I need to know. The second way this changes things for us is it it allows us to walk by faith and not by sight. See, we're trained to process God based on what we see around us. Oh, God's not working. Oh, God didn't come through. Oh, God didn't answer our prayer. We say this so often, you know, but God didn't answer our prayer. How do you know God didn't answer your prayer? Well, because we prayed for A and we got B. How do you know that that B isn't better than A? Well, it's obvious, Louie. Anybody who looked at A and looked at B would know that A is better than B, unless you were God. And you knew that B was going to domino into L, which was going to ping into P and come back around to C. And you're like, who's C? Exactly. (laughs) And so my new grid says, God, I know you have a plan. I see A, I see B. We prayed for A, you gave us B. There must be something about this that we don't see. Therefore, we're going to walk by faith and not by sight, and we're going to say God didn't answer the plan in the way that we thought was the best answer to the plan, but I promise you he answered our prayer. He didn't answer our prayer and give us the answer that we saw as the best answer, but I promise you he answered our prayer. You know why? Because he has a plan, always has a plan, and his plans never fail, and his plans are always for our good and his glory, and we believe right now He's working for our good and his glory. 2 Corinthians 5, it says we live by faith and not by sight. You say that doesn't sound very practical. It's extremely practical. It's, it's, It's moving into situations with a new mindset and saying God is working. God is providing. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Well, then show me where it is. I, 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 I don't see everything God sees, and I don't know everything God knows, and how would I know how God is working right now in his global plan? I just know that I can trust him. The third, I think, practical, and I would lead you to this text, is to dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. That's what, that's what our job is. God's job is to fulfill the plan. Our job is to dwell right where we are and to cultivate faithfulness. That's Psalm 37.3, and that's the New American Standard 
translation from 1977. You know how sometimes you look up a verse, you're like, I think I know it says this, and it shows you the verse in like 20 different translations, and you go, oh, there's the one that says the way I'd heard it somewhere in a message in the past. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. That The whole text says, trust in the Lord. So there's the walk by faith. And then what do I do then? Do good. Do good. Do good at your job. Do good at whatever is in your hand right now. Do good at the thing that God has given you to hold right now. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. If you will cultivate that sense of faithfulness, you will discover that God is faithful. And as you discover that God is faithful, it leads you to say, in this moment right now, even though I cannot see everything, I am certain God has a plan, and I'm certain he has a plan for me, so I am going to be faithful with the thing he has put in my hand today. And I'm going to trust him with the rest of the plan. I'm not going to fumble today because I'm concerned about trying to get my hands on tomorrow. I'm just going to be steady with what he's given me today, knowing that it's his job to take care of tomorrow. And then the last part is just to keep entrusting everything to him who is faithful. I love this passage in 2 Timothy. Um, Paul is under pressure. So this message is a, it's best, I think, applied for people who don't know what's going on right now. If you're on cruise control and everything's great and life's amazing, then you don't even need this message because you don't need a plan. You've got a plan. You're doing fantastic. Life's good. And you can check back in with God at some other season. But if you're in a situation in life where it doesn't seem like anything's adding up, then you can understand someone like Paul who's under a lot of pressure. And he's coming to the end of his life. He's in prison for his faith. And this is what he writes. I'll read beginning in verse 6. He says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. See, God has a plan. (laughs) But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Now, can we just pause there for a moment? The the part I really want us to see is the next line, but can we just pause there for a moment? God has done this amazing work. God has had this amazing plan. That amazing work and plan included me, Paul is saying, and that's why I'm suffering the way I'm suffering. You're like, are you, uh, uh, wait a minute, are you saying that sometimes in God's plan that it ends up hurting? No, he's saying that. He, Paul, who is writing most of the New Testament, said, that is why I am suffering as I am, because I'm in God's plan, and in God's plan put me in this prison, in these chains, under this emperor who thinks he has a plan. But God has a plan, a bigger, better plan, an unstoppable plan, a plan that included me in that plan, a plan for my good and his glory. And sadly, I'm going to have to die for a minute, but that's also going to be good 
He says that a, a few pages over. That's going to work out okay. And he's going to get glory. I am in his plan. I'm not trying to get him into my plan. And on this earth, all the plans are, are not the way we would think the plans would be. But we have a good God that we know we can trust. And so he says this down to the end. Yet this is no cause for shame. In other words, I'm not stressed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. You talk about certainty. If there is a line of scripture that has got certainty in every corpuscle of it, it is that line. I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. In other words, whatever I keep entrusting to God is in good hands. Whatever I keep entrusting to his care, I know he is going to care for. And whatever I entrust to him, I know I can count on God doing what God's going to do, which is take care of it until that day day. So are you trusting your coworker to God? Are you entrusting your children into the hands of God? Are you entrusting your situation into God's hands? Are you saying, you know what? It's not A and, and we prayed for A and now we got B, but we're just taking B and entrusting it into your hands, believing we know who we have believed in and we know that you are able to keep that which we have committed to you against that day. So we're giving you B, God, because that's what we've got right now, but we believe you're going to take care of me. And then when we see you, that final moment, that final revelation, that final glimpse, when everything now is known, that be in your hands is going to be something amazing more than we could have dreamed or imagined. We're just going to keep entrusting things in our life into the hands of God versus saying, well, God didn't give us A, God gave us B, so we're just going to hold on to what we've got because obviously he can't manage things. So say, no, God, I'm just going to entrust this to you. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to do good. I'm going to dwell on the land. I'm going to cultivate faithfulness. I've got a grid that says you have a plan. I am confident and certain you have a plan. So when the circumstance is diminishing our understanding of the plan, the cross reminds us again that we can trust the heart of God who always has a plan. There are going to be days and times and seasons where the plan of God is obscured by the circumstance around us. And that's when we're going to cling again to the cross of Christ who in that moment, that cross and Christ are going to help us see and know again that you can trust his heart that his arms are strong, his heart is good. We're just a few days away from passion at Mercedes-Benz. I think most everybody knows that. And I've told this story, but given the season we've been in for the last little while, we're kind of telling the stories of our house, telling the stories of our movement. And in Passion 2013, we were in the Georgia Dome, a building that doesn't even exist anymore, a football stadium that's gone. And it was a big step for us. We'd been in the dome the year before with a curtain halfway. And uh, we said, what do you guys think about tearing down that curtain? And we did and um, came back in January of 2013 and filled up the dome. I think they have a photo of it. We had the, what a lot of people called the Pokemon stage, <laughs> which I didn't really know a lot about Pokemon. So maybe we did, maybe we didn't, but uh, we'll pay somebody later. And so we're coming into this moment and 
the, the craziest set of circumstances. Passion exists because of a very foggy season for Shelly and me. Our family, 1995, had lost my dad. Um, he died on April 28th, and he was buried here in Atlanta on May 1st on a Monday. And Shelly and I, in the season just before that, had sensed the Lord saying to us, you need to leave behind your ministry in Texas and move to Atlanta and help your mom take care of Louis's dad. And so we had transitioned through the school year. Now we're to the end of the semester, and we're moving to Atlanta. We are saying goodbye to our Bible study movement at, in Texas at Baylor, 10 years of Monday nights of gathering students together there and leading them. And our last Monday nights, May 1st, 10 years, celebration, goodbye, thank you, God bless you, we're sending you off to Atlanta. On May 1st, the day we buried my father in Atlanta, we missed our going away send off from 10 years of ministry because we were here burying my dad, who was the reason we were leaving our ministry. And so we were in a city without a job or a purpose. We had no reason on a Monday except to settle my dad's affairs and to help my mom transition back into life, which she'd been basically slowly checking out of for seven years of caring for my dad. We didn't have a, anything. Talk about being frustrated and confused, angry. Not, I wasn't angry at God. I was angry at me. It was like, duh, when he said in November you can move, you needed to go in November. But a vision came. About six weeks later, picture, sitting on an airplane. We didn't know what it was, how to get there, what to call it, what the first step was. We just knew that's what we're supposed to do. And that vision is passion. And so we took a step. About 18 months later, Passion 97, Austin, Texas, 2,000 students showed up. Uh, 98, 5,000 came, 99 to Fort Worth, 11,000 came, and in 2000, 40,000 college students came to Memphis, Tennessee from all over America and around the world for a solemn assembly called One Day 2000. And it was the picture that I had seen on the plane. So we thought we were done. We didn't do anything the next year. <laughs> and then God was like, uh, not finished. So we're back in it, and by 2013, here we were coming to the Georgia Dome in faith and in belief that if we take that step, that God would bring the people and that something powerful and transformational would happen that would change lives and change history. So I'm walking up to the Pokemon stage, which is in the middle of the field because we're playing in the center of the field. And as I'm walking up to this stage, inside the inner ring to the, to the round part in the middle, I almost completely lose it. Because I was standing on that field the day before, giving the invocation for the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. And I was right out on the field. And um, Clemson and LSU were playing. And in the middle of the field was, of course, the Chick-fil-A logo. And once that game ended and the field was cleared, that black terraplast that you saw was put down to cover the field quickly. And then lighting that we had already suspended a lot of up in the ceiling was lowered. A stage was built. Chairs were put in place. And all of a sudden now, we're starting the largest indoor event we had done up until this time. Maybe the largest event we had done at Passion up until this time. 
And I'm walking up the stairs onto the stage and I realized I was just here looking down on this field and what is still on that field underneath the terraplast and underneath this stage that I'm going to stand on for the next four days is the Chick-fil-A logo that my dad created in 1964 at the biggest event in Passion's history which exists because my father died and I ended up in a season of I don't know what I'm supposed to do in all that confusion. I didn't get an answer from God that day. I didn't get an answer for why my dad became disabled. I did not get an answer for why our family went through seven years of hardship. I did not get an answer for why my dad suddenly died of a heart attack on the day that he did. I didn't get an answer for why we left one ministry behind to come into another. I just got a re-confirmation in my heart that God is in control. Louis, you're going to lead these four days standing on your dad's logo that he created. One Louis Giglio down below and another one up above. Louis, don't forget, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. And my plan for your life is to be in my plan. And I'm not telling you the whole plan. I don't owe that to you. But I am including you in my plan. You just be faithful with what I put in your hands today. And I believe God's probably given every one of us a little glimpse like that. Oh, you probably didn't get the whole like three ring binder. I know I haven't. But I bet God's given you a glimpse, a tiny one, even a minuscule glimpse just to let you know I'm here and I'm working and you can be sure of this. You can be sure of this. I've got a plan and that plan includes you.